to the neon lights. It's where I want to be because I'm just trying to make it. You're listening to the Diamonds in the Rough podcast. I'm just trying to make it. Powered by Prospects Live. That's about as official as it gets. Is yeah, it we're on another level now. Yeah, we're back. It's uh, let's see. It's now Wednesday. I'm so used to saying Thursday. Wednesday, May 11th. This is our second episode on the Prospects Live platform, and our schedule should be good now. Should be on Wednesdays for foreseeable future with with the flashback show on Saturday. Um, if there is a show that you'd like to see on saturday comment it tomorrow on our twitter and we will throw it up there because we're fur to people um fur to yeah fur to i as always am your host cole wilcox joined by my co-host nick schnell and our producer grayson shook we're back for another edition of diamonds in the rough and boys what's going on just chilling just been grinding the harry potter series yeah, you also got in a game today. Yeah, freaking got got some some five innings worth of play in. Went well. One Feeling for good. two, single, walk, strikeout. Could have done without the strikeout, but, you know, timing was a little bit off. But made the adjustment my last at bat and hit an absolute laser off Matt Harvey. So, shout out Matt Harvey. You have to come on the podcast now. The Dark Knight. Mm-hmm. He has to come on now because I'm his dad. Yeah, if that's the case, so does uh, Redone. Yeah, he does too. So does oh, – well, Boz already came on. <laughs> Who else? Just go through just, everyone you've ever got a hit off of. Yeah, should I just start calling people out? So here's what's funny. I, I was talking about this with Schnell the other day. So he, he's been taking some live ABs off pitchers who were making some, like, rehab starts. And he, did, he faced Boz the other day, and he's faced another guy. And I was watching – and so the first at bat he got a hit, I think, and the second at bat, the guy, or no, the first at bat he had a pretty long at bat, but he ended up striking out on a bad swing. And yeah. so we got back to the locker room, and Schnell was talking about the at bat, and he was like, "Yeah, but I was battling. I fouled off some pitches. Like he felt good about the at bat, but that's the that's like the difference in hitters and pitchers. Like they they go out of that bat thinking, all right, I did good, I battled. I'm going out of that bat if I'm the pitcher, I'm like, I just absolutely dominated him. Like you see that swing at the very end." It's just funny how yeah. pitchers and hitters are so different. Like, because there's no defense in live BPs. So there'd be well, a That's like the hit, confidence like, side of things. Like, we always, like, at least me, like, I try and find the positive and everything. So I'm like, all right, yeah, you just battled the quality at bat. You saw probably eight pitches. Goes down as a quality at bat. Next time, just freaking get on top, whatever it is, get on top of it and drive in again. And I mean, you, you don't want to strike out. I technically lost the at bat, but in my brain, it was a good at bat. Yeah, uh, it I'm makes sense. Get frustrated. It, it makes sense, but it's it's funny how you look it's at stuff. Polar different. opposite. Yeah, and if there's like a chopper up the middle, then it's like a big debate. Like, oh, was that a hit? It was definitely a hit. The pitch <laughs> like, nah, no had chance. One of those. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a big that's a big live BP debate too. Uh, no infield there. We've had some uh, some DNR athletes lately make make some big splashes. Uh, none more than Alec Thomas getting the call up and hitting a double in his first game. So, I mean, it was a matter of time. Like, the dude the dude ranked last year. Like, his numbers in AAA were stupid, even when we interviewed him. He was, I, he was I think we should probably drop that one Saturday, honestly. Yeah, but true. I, I feel like that makes sense. So, yeah, you'll hear from him on Saturday if you haven't heard from him before. But awesome interview. And we talked about his numbers, I guess, in 2021. When he was – he hit, like, 320 in AAA for – 60 games or something like he was ready to roll so it was good to see him calm up and and him make a splash and he's he's pretty special hitter for sure and shook sent me a tweet earlier i think i tweeted down on our account yeah i did henry davis in his first double a at bat going yeah yeah it was a new too so so i mean listen if, if you're willing to come on this pod clearly it translates to the field so, uh, don't don't be don't be shy, don't be shy coming on DNR, and it's going to give you that boost that you need to get you to the next level. Should no doubt. What is there anyone that stands in the way of Henry and the and the pirate system? Uh no, not really. Um, yeah. 
triple A catchers or uh, Carter Benz is a guy that they got from the Mariners for TA Tyler Anderson. And then um, other than that, it's just a bunch of guys that are kind of hanging on. So he's, you think he's, he, when do you think he makes his debut? Well, see, with the Pirates, a lot of it depends on how they play. Because, like, if they're sucking, you know, next year or towards the end of this year, then there's no reason not to call him up. I mean, it can't get any worse. But on the flip side, you also don't want to ruin him and, you know, kill his confidence because he's out there struggling against guys. He doesn't lack confidence. He ain't going to do that to him. Yeah, I mean, Henry's kind of an exception there. But I think sometimes you see guys that kind of get rushed up. No, and definitely. it kind of – uh, kills their confidence. Yeah, without a doubt. No, I know. Man, that is a real thing. That's it's like as a player, you want to get there as fast as possible, and it's and it's not. It's you kind of get jealous when you see the organizations that move really fast, and you're like, dang, like that could be me. But and some people thrive in it, like Reed. I mean, Reed, Reed goes straight at the bigs, and we watched him the other day, and he shoved. Like it's some guys are built for it, and some guys are are not. Like if you yeah. go up too fast, Strider. it kind of kills you. And yeah, Strider the same way. That dude doesn't like confidence either. No, so, he <laughs> yeah, he he knows he knows what he's got, but that's good, and it, that's the people that last. And and for some people, you know, you need to face every level and, and build that confidence, and then they get to the show. And I think every organization is different, but it seems like like I mean, look at the race. It's, it's a long time build up, and it's a long time to get there, but the people usually stick. Yeah, they're pretty picky, and and the people that that make the show usually stick in the show, which is the goal. Yeah, the one thing I will say about it, and me and my dad talked about this because they were in Rome uh, two weeks ago, I think. And uh, I think one thing that he's got to work on as he goes through is the defensive side of catching because he – I forget who was pitching for them. Oh, it was Nick Garcia, one of their other prospects. And, you know, he wasn't really sticking the ball very well, just kind of, you know – I don't know. I mean, it's nitpicky. It's it's really nitpicky, but I think – the dude, the dude's bat's gonna play anywhere, and yeah, I think that's what sure. Pirates fans should be excited about. Yeah, they're rakes. It was cool. So I uh, during COVID, I coached in like one of those summer ball leagues. We they had one at Grand Park, and Henry was on my team, and I like threw BP to him and stuff. And all the scouts that were coming were the Midwest scouts that all like looked at me and stuff. So I knew all of them. So they would like ask me questions. I was like <laughs> getting the insider scoop on everything because the scouts were like talking to me about him. Like, what do you think about him? Stuff like that. <laughs> just because I was there. And that's what most of them said is just the defensive thing. Like, this is something that people don't realize. But so most catchers use a, I don't even know what size glove they use, but he was using three fourths size smaller than what, almost an inch smaller than what most catchers use. So he was trying to catch with that. And he was, like, having trouble every once in a while. Like, when you catch, it would hit the tip of his glove sometimes. But then I think now he's using a bigger glove, and he's getting better. At least that's how he used the big mitt, right? Catch, I mean, yeah. pitchers love to see that big that big paw back there. <laughs> yeah. But that's nice to throw it there. You got to use the big one. That dude, dude is very good at baseball. Yeah. Number one picks usually are. Yeah. I was uh I was scrolling through our Twitter, and <laughs> – I don't even know if y'all saw when I tweeted this, but I found this dude. There's a thread not too far down, but this guy climbs the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, which is 1,070 feet. He yeah, climbed I've the entire that. thing. He got to the very top and they arrested him. You shouldn't arrest him for that. I mean, that's an accomplishment. If, if you have to like pick him up off the side, yes, arrest him. Yeah. If he gets to the top, <laughs> he's got High five him. You buy his lunch. Yeah. Like that's him. What possessed you to do that anyway? It's unbelievable. Thinking back, actually, now thinking of, thinking back on that summer when I coached him, I, th- I think he could give me most of the credit as far as, like, pushing the scouts to draft him first overall. He did the playing to get there. But as far as, like, hyping him up to all the scouts, I think yeah. I, I, I deserve, like, what? And you know, and you know they took your words, credit. like, sacredly. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like I would say fifty percent is probably me. They're weighing Coach Max, words. like Coach Max word, your word, like yours obviously. Yeah, you it. know it's probably twenty five, twenty five, and then his play was the other fifty. But that's probably fair. Probably fair. Uh, let's get let's get into a segment, and 
first segment on the new platform. We'll start with a classic. It is three one breaker two zero heater, and this is this is pretty much a three one breaker you got throughout the week or a two zero heater you got throughout the week. Uh, you never want to see either of those, or you do want to see two zero heater. Never want to see a three one breaker. So, um, Chanel, let's start with you. Three one breaker of the week. Let's start with two zero heater of the week because okay. I don't exactly know what my three one breaker. You had a great be. week. Um, two zero heater was getting to play today. I've eleven months since the last time I played in a game, so that What'd was. You... Go ahead. What did you get to hit on? What time. pitch? Fastball. <laughs> Naturally, two zero. Uh, one zero. Ah, you had a one zero heater. A two zero heater actually, and a two zero heater would have been sick. Actually, no, it was two zero. He threw me a slider, a back foot Perfect. slider. I took change up down. And then he threw me a fastball over the middle of the plate. And I said, I'm not missing this. And got the 2 0 heater. Yeah, I got the 2 0 heater. Wow, that works out perfectly. That works That's out great. crazy. Works out great. But yeah, it was it was pretty sick being able to play again. Uh, get to play again on Friday, I think. Saturday. Yeah, Friday. Maybe Saturday. I can't remember. One of the two. It'll be a good day, regardless. Yeah. Shook, you got a 2 0 heater? 2-0 heater for this week is Florida State softball set a single game record with seven home runs in a game, the last regular season game of the season against NC State. Um, Sydney Sherrill, who's like an icon at Florida for Florida State softball, she's been there for like sixteen thousand years. She's a Kevin and, uh, senior. Yes, she's she's a super she's a super super duper senior. Um, yeah, but she hit three home runs in that game, which was sick because she's not known as a home run hitter. So it was just kind of cool to see. But that's my 2-0 heater. Uh, kind of weird series for them. So game one on Friday had to be finished on Saturday because of rain. Then game two Saturday was um, started and then postponed after two batters. And then Sunday they finished game three before they restarted game two. So kind of interesting little schedule there for them. But the Seminoles softball team is my 2-0 heater. Nice. Ball's leaving the yard. That in yes. Is it Tallahassee, right? Uh, they were in Raleigh this weekend, but yeah. Okay. Uh, my 2-0 heater of the week, uh, my parents – both grandparents and Kenzie are coming down this weekend. They they got a spot in Fort Myers. So just for the weekend, hadn't seen hadn't seen my grandparents or parents since I came down here in January. It's been a little while. Mama's missing me. Uh, so they're they're flying in Thursday. Um, and then my three one or yeah three one breaker was you couldn't script this any better. So, as most of you know, the new listeners, you will know, I'm a diehard Georgia sports fan, diehard Falcons fan. So, like, yeah, I'm, I'm used to 28 to three jokes. They they're ingrained in my in my mind and body. So I get my vitamin D tested today at the field. Where I actually got it tested a while back, and our nutritionist was giving me the vitamin D and explaining to me like, here's your levels. This is why you need to take this. Blah blah. blah. We said, all right, so we tested you back and whatever, and your levels were 28.3. And I was like, classic. And I had and I had a guy sitting in front of me, big Jets fan, and Al, our nutritionist, a big Jets fan. So big, big football fans. We've been talking about football, and I was just shaking my head. And I was like, what's up? And I was like, 28.3. I just can't escape it. And then they both realized. I thought it was hilarious. It's not funny. <laughs> but but yeah, it's just it's just one of those things, and it's just there. It's always going to be there. You can run, cannot hide. This the jokes never get old. Let me tell you. Uh, Shooker, you got a three-one breaker. So this is not a good time to use this for the first segment, but I'm going to anyway. So I'm approaching this three-one breaker as um something I did not expect. Yeah. So, works. but it was a good thing. So it's kind of a twist, but whatever. Okay. I do what I want. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the beach volleyball national championship was this weekend on ESPN two. And I know this is super weird and off topic, but 
beach volleyball is legit, man. Yeah, yeah. The, the Florida, beach volleyball, volleyball is Olympics sick. is sick. Yeah. So Florida State came in as the five seed in the tournament, survived their first round match, and then uh, anyway, just like following that and like following them, like we were talking about many? grit and is determination. Two, two people always on yeah. beach volleyball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's tough. I, I feel like when I was when I'm watching the Olympics, those people are so good at beach volleyball that whoever serves does not get the point usually. I feel like right, right, yeah. I feel right. Like if you if you if you don't get the ace and it plays out, you're getting whacked. Mm-hmm. Like things get coming at you quick. Yeah, and if you do save, it's a big deal. So like, yeah, that's those are electric matches. Yeah, they think. lost both matches to USC three one. That's and not fair. They beat USC's like dominant in beach volleyball. Like I, can see I think why. they've I think they've won like four national championships since it moved to the NCAA. I would say West Coast teams are are solid at beach volleyball. Yeah, and so is that an NCAA of, sport or no? So it wasn't until 2016, and so since 2016 they've won four championships, which is I think four out of six or five maybe. Nice. But uh. So one of their pairs had not been beaten all season. They were like 38-0, and the Florida State number two pair beat them, which was sick because they were both red shirt COVID super seniors again. So the COVID super seniors for Florida State had a good weekend, nice. I guess is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> nice. Schnell, you thought of one yet? You need me to go again. You got another one? Well, I just thought of one. I just thought of one. This is getting ridiculous. So I'll go keep thinking. So this Florida is notorious for lizards. I mean, they're everywhere. They are everywhere. And the naturally, like sometimes they get in the house. I don't know where they get in from. They come from like, I have two in my room. There's a big sliding glass door. And in the living room, there's a big sliding glass door. Somehow they get through there. I don't know if there's a crack or something in, in the seal. Who knows? But they come in. But dude, ever since I've gotten here, they get bigger and bigger every time I see them. It's like, I don't know if it's the same one and it just grows. But when I first got here, like I see them in the shower sometimes and they'd be like little small ones. And the other day, I think I, I'm going to end up posting it after I talk about it. I was sitting in the living room and there was a dang dragon roll up. And it just like, like right by the, the table and chairs, I'm just sitting in the recliner. It's Sunday. I just cooked breakfast and I'm eating it. And I look up, and this thing is like doing push-ups over there by the window. It is massive. So I don't. I've got I've got an issue with these lizards, and and if they keep getting bigger, I'm not gonna have enough room for them in the house. <laughs> so that's that's my three-one breaker. I still don't really have one. I guess the only the only three-one breaker, which isn't like it wasn't unexpected or anything. It's just. I'm ready. I'm ready for Carly and Bo to be down here. I miss my, I miss my son. Yeah. So. Yeah, I would say so. Had to be pretty tough. Yeah. Dang, did I save that lizard video? Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, it's massive. Like how big are we talking? Like iguana big? Yeah, I mean, dang near. Here, let's see if you can see it on here. Good lord. Yeah, Dude, that's, so a, yeah. that's an alligator. Yeah, there is John. Oh, <laughs> speaking of alligators, when I got back, um, I went out to fish for a little bit and dude, it was from the houses that are like so you know the place where we walk up to the fish in that pond, Cole? Which one? The, the one like right across the street. Yeah, yeah. Those houses on the other side, it was walking in between the houses, dude. It was massive. Like I saw it walk all the way down and into the water. Like and terrifying. then I would I kept wanting to move the fish another spot. And dude, I was terrified because I would be seeing it. And then right when I'd start walking, it'd go under. And I had no idea it was that. And I was like, I'm gonna get eaten by an alligator. But alligators are terrifying. I don't I, I sacked up and still went and moved around. That that pond that was the dad there. strength kicking in. Yeah. Hundred percent. Speaking of dad strength, if if you guys don't know, we've already talked about, it, but I hit a home run in my first light BP back after having a son. So it is yeah. true. Twenty four twenty four point five thousand of you seen it on Instagram. Yeah, seen the Schnelly bomb. Yeah, just popped. Yeah. Sorry speaking of, it. everyone go follow our Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. We vow to be better at TikTok. 
if we're we're about to be TikTok stars. If if our freaking listen, also TikTok I'll send this manager. out to anyone. I'll send it. This is going out to the public because I'm now offered. Yeah, Cooper Kitty, he lives with me now. He's supposed to be. He's a young kid. He's he's literally a he's baby. literally our child. He's 19 years old and he's a TikTok guy. He's supposed to be giving us ideas, and I told him I'd give him five dollars for every 10,000 views we get. Well, this goes out to the public now because I also offered my sister. There's been no help at this point. So if y'all have a TikTok, like a trend or something that is popping up a lot and we can spin it in baseball in any way, shape, or form, we're probably not going to dance. We'll do most things. I don't know. Heck, just send it. We might. But send it to us with the baseball idea. And if it gets, I'll give you, I will Venmo you $5 for every 10,000 views it gets. Hey, not a lot of money, but listen, if one pops and goes for a million, that's a free 50 bucks. Take the family out for a night. That's minute. true. I'll, you know what? I'll, I'll freaking – I'll jump on the train with you. There we go. I mean, you can make So $100. now you get five from him and five from me. That goes out to the public. Yeah, uh, that's – Also, so just, if there's it, like a, a – TikTok video. Idea. Not it's even cool. a trend, but if you guys have an idea for us that we can like, hey, you guys should do this. We'll do it. We'll do it. So just let us know. We're also on a new platform today because this is a people – this is what uh, Prospects Live uses, and it's the StreamYard, and it's actually very nice. It, it kind of puts Zoom to shame. Even our cameras look better, and we're using the same Yeah, thing. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Also, did you see Shook just beast and freaking put that thing at the bottom while we were talking? That was yeah, slick, yeah. Shook. That was slick. Yeah, that was sure. nasty. <laughs> Yeah, we're getting, we're getting pretty solid out here. We're All literally right. so professional, like, <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> All right, we're the best oh, at this. Dude, I didn't even talk about this. I didn't even talk about our interview coming up. Our interview is the legend, legendary pitcher and legendary pitching coach, Rick Honeycutt. Uh, he's the interview was incredible. He's it a was, freaking thesaurus for baseball yes. information. Yes, that's a big word, Smelly. Thanks. Yeah, he it was he was spitting out baseball legends like like they're barbecue sunflower seeds. Just it was, it was Reggie Jackson, Thurman Munson. It was like, dang, this is sick. And he recalled every pitch of every at bat he ever pitched. He literally has a a perfect memory. We're gonna have so many clips. To he remembers when he was born. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. <laughs> he remembers everything ever. It was crazy. Oh yeah, it was it was <laughs> awesome. He could have talked all day too about it. He was the man. He had a sick. He had a sick baseball crib set up. Yeah, he did. What's some freaking crazy stuff that's going on? And what's something crazy that's happened the MLB or something? Well, last night, um, so oh, my hat just came apart. Josh Naylor. Yeah. So we've talked about on here before. On my hat just completely. Uh, I look like a scrub. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't even know how to fix it without looking at it either, that gummit. Okay, I think I got it. So, we've talked on here before. You got a freaking melon, by the way. I that know, yeah, that boy is stretched to the unit. brim. <laughs> your, head gets any bigger, you're not, <laughs> your brain gets any bigger, and you're not going to fit in any hats. I know, and I'm going back to school this summer, so I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have no hats. Anyway, back to what's crazy going on in MLB. Um, we've talked about how I forget who got upset. I think it was the Nationals. Somebody was still attempting to score when they were up six runs in the ninth inning, which, in my opinion, is not enough to be upset about. And I've always said that. I, I think unwritten rules in baseball are stupid. I think until the other team, my college coach told me. If they're going to keep trying to score, we're going to keep trying to score. And I completely agree. So, And then last night was a perfect example. Indians down – oh, that was the I word. Um, Guardians. The, the Guardians down six runs going in the ninth, tied up, win it in extras. So, I don't ever want to hear the run up the score. And in- there was another game. It was Phillies-Angels maybe, and they were – the Phillies were up. Or no, 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 no. It was the uh, – who, who was playing? It, it, Phillies were playing somebody because Aaron Nola dealt the Mets. The Mets, they yeah, it was eight to one, seven, seven to one, seven to one, I think, seven to and one, six runs again. 
literally MLB Network dude started talking, saying like Aaron Nola dominated. Uh, this game's over. We'll be like, they were like, don't say anything yet. And he was like, oh, this game's over. Like we'll be, we'll see you guys soon. And that's came back and beat him. Yeah, I think they like pinch hit somebody or something, and the guy was like, they don't know this game's over. And it was like, ah. they know more than you, I think, because. Six runs is just like it proved last night. That the the Guardian scored two runs and then loaded the bases up, and all of a sudden it's one swing away. Today in our game, we were now the games down here are different because they're rolling innings every once in a while, stuff like that. But we were up eight to two, and the last inning they scored uh, five runs, and it was it ended up being eight to seven. And let me tell you, the last three runs, it was a it was a joy to watch. Dude, prime extended. Dude, prime. Okay, so hold on. I got to tell this story. Yeah, I'll see. So, so Xavier and I, I'm sitting at the end of the dugout, and I'm kind of – it's part of this I put on me because I was doing – this is an unwritten rule too. I was starting to pack my – because I only played five innings, so I was out yeah. of the game. So I started packing fair. packing my stuff up. But you're, you're really not supposed to pack your stuff up before the game's over. It's bad juju. But anyways, so we have two outs – and they've already scored a couple runs. And this dude tries – there's two outs, r- remind you. And this dude's stealing third. Dude hasn't delivered, steps off. Our guy who's pitching steps off. X goes, this is how we're really going to end the game. Our pitcher oh, throws God. the third whoosh, right into right field. <laughs> they score. I look down at X and I go, X. <laughs> and he goes, everybody heard that? And I go, Yeah. <laughs> but it was – dude, there were literally three errors in the last inning for the, uh, for uh, that we made. That The game should have been over way before that. The game started at noon. It got done at three. Brutal. It's not good for the pace of play. No, it wasn't good for my freaking well-being. <laughs> That's what that good for. On the road, too. You got – Dude, first, first game back, back on the, on the road, road – what are they doing? Yeah, that's 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 uh, dreadful. That's Sarasota the thing about. Uh, I do love baseball, though. <laughs> I do love. Yeah. That. I'll go pitch in Alaska right now if that's what it takes. Yeah. That would be sick to pitch in Alaska, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Alaska's sick. I, that's one thing I want to see in my lifetime. Is the the Northern Lights? I want to see yeah, that. Yeah. Cool. The freaking Aurora Borealis. <laughs> Dang it, boy. Yeah, I know. I know things. That's it. I mean, thesaurus and that. Yeah, Aurora Borealis. Can you even pronounce that? Probably not. Well, I just heard you, so how can I not pronounce it? I don't know, dude. Um, Harry Potter, sick. Yeah, last night I was on the uh, I was on a live stream with uh, the boys, um, Joe and and Zach, and I tell them. At the end, I'm like, I don't know if you could hear what's going on out there because I could hear it. I was like, I was waiting on y'all to say something, but Schnelly's out there watching Harry Potter, and it sounds like there's a wizarding duel in my living room right now. But they, they never said anything about it, <laughs> but I could hear it pretty pretty loud and clear. Dude, I'm obsessed with it. I've never seen it before. I'm obsessed with it. I told you it was elite. You might, have to, back, you might have to come back over and watch the next one after this. I might. You know what? Yeah, I don't tip me because I'll, I'll watch it. You don't have to be at the field down noon. So I got popcorn. I pop popcorn. You know what? You know what's crazy is that freaking Hermione ends up with some freaking dud, Ron Weasley, and Harry's out there beasting. You That's wrong. Know, you don't even know who Harry ends up with. Uh, yeah, I know, but I don't need you to. See, you don't know. Just relax. Just keep watching. Um, before we get to Rick Honeycutt. This is everybody's favorite segment. Um, Schnelly's kind of proven that that his mind is working a little faster these days. And I don't know if it's because he's he's now a father or, or what it is. But because I'm a dad. Dude, sharp as a tack. Like, he's, he's out here dropping knowledge on us like, yeah. like they're freaking A-bombs. Um, Schnelly, put us in a pickle. All right. There's two I'm considering right now. I think I'm going to go with when does it stop being partly cloudy and become partly sunny? Or when does it stop being partly sunny and become partly cloudy? Cloudy. Okay. 
It's kind of like, it's kind of half half empty, half, half full. empty, half full. Okay, here's let's see, let's see if I can describe this. This is when I was thinking about. It, this is what I came up with. When, um, dang, I could sound really smart here, but I'm not gonna be able to, and I let's hate it. Try, because, try, because I'm, I, I, I need to, I try. need the freaking library of Congress to freaking to do this. No, 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 no. spit it out. So off the dome. There's no. I'm trying. I don't use our phones and pickles. And I'm know, not prepped. Me should or not prepped for this pickle before it's asked. I know, but I don't know the. So the way I'm thinking about it is, what is a rain cloud called? What kind of clouds? A rain cloud. By cumulonimbus. I'm just gonna. No <laughs> is that what it is? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I was gonna try and like call call him specific clouds. I need Mike Trout on here. He's a big weather guy. Is he? Yeah, he's done. Like he's like big into weather. He loves it. That's sick. he's gonna be a weather guy one day. I think that he's gonna be fine after he's done playing baseball. Does not have to. Yeah, do but that. It's, but he loves it. Like he wants to do it. Really? He, he wants to be a meteor. He wants to be a meteorologist. <laughs> Another big word. <laughs> Proud look after that came out. But that one wasn't that. Good. Okay. Anyway, everybody knows so, what that is. So if the sun if the sun is shining and it's a blue sky with like white clouds, I think it's partly sunny. Okay. Now when the when the clouds start getting darker as if like rain is gonna come, like you know what I'm saying? Like yeah, a, yeah. a front's coming in, yeah. that's when it starts being partly cloudy because that is like the rain's coming. I'm not sure I've ever heard partly sunny, but but I'll yeah, just I, when I was That's reading I was it today, to I don't think I have either. But I'll just take it as when is it partly cloudy and when is it not? Like what's the line? Yeah. To me, it's not – It's not. if it gets to the point you're talking about, I think that's just cloudy. Here's what I think partly cloudy is. When the sun is consistently – like the clouds are moving, but the sun is getting blocked by the by the clouds every like five or six minutes. You know, so it's, it's a nice. duration thing. And it's nice. It's like hot out, and then like the sun is blocked for a little bit. And you're like, oh, please stay there. But you look up and you see they're moving pretty quick, and it's like, dang, this is gonna be like a 30 second bomb. Gone. Here in a couple minutes, it goes by again. That's partly cloudy. So it's it's part duration, and is it part? Because sometimes uh, there's a lot of clouds in the sky, but they don't ever block the sun. It feels like. Yeah. So it's not. So that's not partly cloudy. So it's not. The amount of clouds. It's more of the I think I think it's the positioning of the clouds. Or let's see how I can word this. Or the Time actions. The actions the clouds are carrying out. Like if they're blocking yeah. the sun consistently, then it's part in of the, the positions that the clouds are in. If if they're the not position in the clouds kind of put themselves so, the, the position the clouds put themselves in. If they said yes, exactly. Okay. The, the defense they're playing on the sun. Do you think they know what they're doing? Do, do you think some days the clouds are like, we're going to block the sun for them? Yeah, here we they've go. Been good, here's, they've been here's, good here's, boys. You tried. <laughs> they've been you good, lasted been good. Let's see, 33 minutes, and then we, we had this bull crap. You've been good good boys and girls today, so we're going to block the sun. And then you, you're bad boys and girls, so they don't. Dude, because the sun down here is literally freaking it's terrible. It's Satan's mouth. <laughs> mouth. It's so hot. It's literally so hot. It is just going to get hotter. Yeah, today, dude, I literally looked at everybody and I was like, it's literally the hottest ever out right now. What Was it this week where the, it was? No, it was, no, it was the week day that last was week. Off, it, it, sure. it, no, there oh, was a no, day last day. week. Where yeah, I didn't, I didn't lift that day. My face, my face was so red it hurt. Should you got any comments on partly partly cloudy? Yeah, I think it just depends on the positioning of the clouds, honestly. Okay, and how so much we're, sun so we're is all, we're all is on how, how what kind of defense the clouds are playing on the sun to determine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But also, yeah, I mean, if you're not blocking, it's just bad defense. You can't even call it partly cloudy. I've also never heard partly sunny either. I've heard mostly yeah. sunny. Yeah. I guess that's we're, the we're same calling, thing. But... We're calling fraudulent on that phrase. Uh, yeah, I was, about, dang, I was about to say something. I should have used the other one. The other freak. Oh, okay. So for those of you who haven't heard, Schnelly's best pickle ever had the people in a pretzel. Uh, it was just tell it, Schnelly. 
in what or <laughs> I don't even know if I can say it the right way. Just give us the gist. How important do you have to be to be considered an assassination and not just a murder? Like what makes yeah. it like what what is your importance your importance? And the best part of it was everybody was sending us stuff. I look up the definition and there's no true definition. It was the there's no definition. answer. And, and people say been... go ahead. People say like politics and like um or like religious gain, but like freaking the dude from the Beatles, John Lennon, they consider him an assassination. And some people consider that religion, but you don't really know why. No one knows why he was killed. So and they say assassination. It's it's a legit pickle. It, it pickled people up, and so we've been trying to get one back like that since then. Yeah, dude. It wasn't even just, on the show. I know. You dropped it on I, Instagram. I freaking whipped that out on Instagram, time. huh? Yeah, that was sick. Popped. Yeah. Maybe anyway, I'll put the other one that I thought was pretty good on Instagram or on uh, uh, on the, on the TikTok because the other one's pretty good, but I should have used it. Dang it, man. I, <laughs> I fricked up. Well, that's the show. Uh, we're going to get you over to Rick Honeycutt. Like we said, awesome interview. If you're a fan of baseball in the slightest, this is the one for you. It was awesome. I uh, hope you guys enjoy it, and we will see you. Well, y'all will see us again on Saturday. We recorded that in October. So if we say something that was ridiculous, please gloss right over it. And just, just enjoy the interview. Uh, and as always, stay sparkly. Today we welcome on another very special guest. Um, former former pitcher and pitching coach of the Los Angeles Dodgers, Coach Rick Honeycutt. Coach, how are you doing? Good. Good, Cole. How are you today? Doing really well. Um, and honestly, it feels like I'm talking to a ghost here because uh, the, the name Rick Honeycutt holds a lot of weight back where I'm from. Uh, hold, <laughs> pl- played on Rick Honeycutt Field growing up. Well, actually, this weekend they're having a big, uh, big. Uh, I'm throwing out the first pitch. They have the um, opening ceremonies, but we're having. Uh, I'm excited about. It. They're having an alumni for uh, uh, really anybody that played in the PRA. When I grew up, it was called Post Recreation Association up there around um, Barnhart Circle. Okay. And my dad and a bunch of the uh, guys back then uh, that built that. That field and then they built the the next the uh, little league field and then of course they've added several more fields up there but uh yeah that uh place is uh, true to my heart up there that's where the first first place i got to you know play um organized baseball and uh we had some pretty good little teams when we were growing up and uh, a lot of fond memories back there yeah, no doubt. Um, it's that, that area has gotten really nice the last couple of years, especially the baseball fields and stuff. They put some put some money into it for sure. Um, so, do you still live in the Chattanooga area, like right now? Yeah, I live in Ringo. Uh, my wife, uh, we moved back here when I got traded from LA to Oakland. Uh, my kids were, oh, they were like four and seven at the time. So my wife wanted to get them stabilized somewhere in school. And um, we moved back. First, we moved back to Signal Mountain. And then uh, we moved off the mountain, I think, in oh, about 97 or 8. And then in 2004, uh, my wife uh, found some property. We got 100 acres out here in uh, Ringgold. So she's got some horses and so, um, uh, yeah, we've made our home here since in the Chattanooga area back since, uh, 88. Gotcha. Long time. No way you had the heart to send your kids to the enemy to Ringgold. <laughs> no, they went, they both went to Baylor. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That is so, some of those things don't end. I mean, that's ongoing. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, yeah, no, we, well, like I said, we were on Signal Mountain, and then as they grew up, then uh, they went to, they were going to have to go, I think, to Red Bank, <laughs> and that wasn't <laughs> going to work. So uh, we went to, uh, they both graduated from uh, Baylor High School here in Chattanooga. Okay. All right. Cool. We actually, uh, I'm sure you know, but we have a guy down here rehabbing us with us now, Cooper Kenny, who went to Baylor, uh, one of the Rays' first rounders. And, so he's actually living with right. Chanel right now. So he's yeah. down here representing Baylor, doing it well. Yeah. 
But well, he was. I I got to keep up a little bit with him. My uh, brother-in-law was the trainer over at Baylor uh, okay. for for a long time, and uh, of course he's he kept me up. And so I'd I'd look on uh, the internet and stuff, keep up with them. I guess uh, his senior year, they really had a, a really strong ball club. So uh, <laughs> yeah, their team was loaded. Great, great season, no doubt about it. Uh, but I wanted to wanted to get into your playing career a little bit, and uh, I don't even know if you know, but and I don't know if you were talking to my dad about this or what it was, but you had mentioned it was when I was going through the draft in high school, and uh, you had mentioned your college days and talked about just how much you enjoyed playing at Tennessee, and um, it was kind of the first time you were away from home and kind of the experience you got there, and that weighed a lot on me when I was making my decision. Um, a guy like you who's played 20 years in the league, coached in the league, and you talk about how how fond of your college memories you were. Um, what what made you go to Tennessee, and how did the recruiting process work at that time? Yeah, it um, nothing like probably what you had to go through. You probably had you well, you had the scouts knocking down your door too, so you had you had a little bit more going on. Even though I did get drafted by Baltimore out of high school, but not till the thirteenth round and. So the money wasn't uh, wasn't what it uh, is that you probably had to make the, that decision on. Um, so, um, you know, most of the SEC schools around here, I mean, Vanderbilt pushed really hard. Georgia pushed really hard. Uh, I had two buddies that signed football scholarships up at UT, Jay Bass and uh, Steve Poole. And so we were all in the same class, grew up together. And they went to UT, but I, I pretty much grew up kind of a UT fan. And even though UT baseball probably wasn't as strong at that time, Vanderbilt, I know it's been a powerhouse, but UT didn't have the baseball power that they got here the last couple of years. They've obviously been been off the chart here the last couple of years. But uh, I just wanted to go where a couple of my buddies were going. I, I was a big UT fan, mainly football fan. But went up and saw the, uh, you know, the facilities and what they were trying to do. Um, and I was just, you know, comfortable going to UT. Uh, uh, Bandy had um, a couple guys from Chattanooga that I knew that I played summer ball with, but they were both a year older than me. But uh, kind of just came down to comfort level where I wanted, where I wanted to go. And um, uh, so I, I chose, chose Tennessee and... Like I said, I enjoyed uh, that experience. Like I didn't have that choice of the big money, so it was like me just coming down to you know where I felt most comfortable, um, where to go to college, and and um, you know keep keep trying to get better and get uh, eventually drafted again. Yeah. What What would you say was the biggest adjustment you had to make from coming from our town to um, a big school like University of Tennessee? Well, um, you know, I mean, uh, obviously the competition is there. I was able to, you know, go right in and, and be one of the uh, weekend pitchers, uh, which was which was, was neat. I didn't have to be the opening day. I was probably that first year probably pitch, you know, on the – uh, we played though we played a doubleheader on uh, Saturday and then a single game on Sunday uh, the way we did it back then so it wasn't you know three game like fr like you went through Friday Saturday and Sunday most of the SEC so um, uh, we had like I said we'd have doubleheaders and um, in a single game on Sunday so but I was able to come in I was you know good enough to um, um, be one of the weekend pitchers. So that was, that was pretty exciting and, um, had good, had good group of guys that, um, you know, they, they took me under their wing a little bit and just, uh, made me feel relaxed. Uh, I know that my, I think my first college win was in South Alabama, uh, back when, um, uh, Eddie Stanky, uh, that's going way back in a, in a name, but Eddie Stanky was, a you know, actually uh, played in the big leagues and was a, a big league manager. And then, he, but he was from that area. And then he went back and and um, uh, was the head coach at South Alabama. And they had a good program back then. So, uh, but that was that was pretty cool experience. You know, to get my first um, college win 
against uh, a team pretty well ranked in the country at that time. And yeah. um, so it just kind of kind of went on. But I was a pitcher and a first baseman and didn't get that many at-bats my freshman year because there was a senior first baseman. And uh, But he graduated and then starting my sophomore year, then I started um, – either playing first base or DHing even the games that I didn't pitch. So uh, I was able to pursue hitting and pitching and um, actually was drafted as both. When I left, when I left Tennessee, I don't know if you know this, but I was actually an all American first baseman at Tennessee my senior year. And yeah. um, uh, so uh, Pittsburgh drafted me and uh, I, DH'd every game and pitched every fifth day or whenever the, you know, the time came. And, but then then went to instruction league and, and there they pretty much uh, kind of switched me over to being, you know, full-time pitcher after, after that. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, I mean, obviously everybody knows you as a pitcher and, but not only were you uh, all American hitter, you had the SEC batting title at 404. You could swing it a little bit. Yeah. I also well, saw that you uh, go ahead. <laughs> no, that was, uh, you know, but you know what, for me, Cole, it was, um, you know, I didn't get drafted after my junior, which most guys like you, you, you get drafted, you know, early on. And, and it really was kind of a wake up call for me not to, and I was, you know, pitching pretty good in the SEC and still hitting. I think even that year I hit 370 something I didn't get drafted at all. You go through all the rounds, not getting drafted. And it was a real wake up call. And I really um, kind of had a heart to heart with myself sitting down. It's like, you know, well, I'm going to go, you know, make this senior year to be the best I can be. I gotten uh, probably uh, even worked harder in the weight room and got, you know, just in, in great shape and, and was able to have a, you know, real, real solid season, um, you know, hitting and, and also pitching. I mean, I just love baseball. Just I wanted to be on the field every day, so I got that opportunity to do that. Yeah. And uh, remember the scouts coming around. I mean, they liked they liked my my swing, but I was not, you know, probably didn't have the, you know, the metrics that were going to be like a big home run hitter. And um, they worked me out in the outfield and and. Um, things and you know several scouts that I talked to later you know they said well I had you down as a hitter you know and other guys go well we like you know we liked your command and da 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 da, da. And so <laughs> whatever it just worked out it worked out you know I just got the opportunity to play and then you know got the chance uh, I was didn't even after all that year the senior year I didn't get you know didn't get drafted high and it's just like hey you know just go go take your chance and you know um, do the best you can and things worked out yeah for sure and, and before we moved on I was gonna I was gonna ask how much you're keeping up with the team there now because they are rolling yeah I talked to uh coach every now and then but I mean geez uh when they went down to Mississippi and swept them I mean I knew they had a good club and even our uh, Dodger scout I, he lets me know every time he goes down there and he's like you know these guys are really really interesting and and uh i think they're gonna be really good he said all three start you know all three of the weekend pitchers were dominant and that's even without kidwell yeah who i saw pitch last year up there and i was like geez and um uh, so watched uh two of the games of the vanderbilt game uh series and um you know just super impressed but you know coach Vitello, i mean what a he's been like a you know, uh, breath of fresh air, air for, you know, Tennessee, because he comes in there, he brings a high energy, mm -hmm. great recruiter and uh, made a lot of good decisions. And coach Anderson, their pitching coach, obviously he's top notch. I actually uh, coached his son, Brett. He was with the Dodgers for uh, a couple of years. So uh, <clears throat> knew about his dad, <clears throat> about coach Anderson back when, Brett was pitching for me in the, in LA. So, uh, getting to meet him. So they do the thing, they do things right up there. They, they pitch well, good defense. And obviously got a, uh, they have right now they have pretty much about everything that you'd look for yeah. from, from a team. So they're, they're pretty exciting right now. Yeah. I've, I've said before, we got to get 
Coach Vitale on the show because he seems – he clearly recruits really well, so he's got he's got to be a good interview. He seems like a high-energy guy would be fun to talk to. Um, yeah, they, but, you can tell from the team since he's been there. I mean, they take on his personality, and it's yeah. – uh, he's got some fire in his belly and shows it every day and they play with the chip on their shoulder and they go out there. And I mean, what they've been doing this season, has just been off the charts. I mean, um, I mean, they're, they've got it working. That's for sure. Yeah. It's, it's not often you see a team, especially in the SEC, as you know, it's, it's not often you see a team just like look head and shoulders better than everybody they're playing on the weekend series. That's tough to do with, you know, with the amount of talent in that conference. <clears throat> they've got, you know, talent at every position, but what really stands out to me because being a pitching coach and being a pitcher and, you know, watching, I mean, those guys, they run out there with, with the ball every, every night. That's pretty impressive stuff. They're throwing out there, those starting pitchers, all, all three of them. And they're young. I mean, yeah, two of them are freshmen and one of them is a sophomore. And like I said, Kidwell is just now coming back. So, um, that's I don't think there's probably any any other school in the country that can match up those those four arms you know no. coming at you every, every night. No, and I saw they're getting a guy back who me and Schnell played with in high school, Seth Halverson. He's another high nineties arm. I didn't even know he was on the team, and I saw he was coming back. I was like, Lord have mercy! <laughs> I thought he was at Missouri. He was at Missouri. Clearly, he transferred. I didn't know it, but yeah, that's that's another big time arm. I mean, he was he's yeah. explosive stuff. Throws gas. Yeah. So. I tell you, they got guys sitting on the bench probably play in a lot of different places. So, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's a wealth of, wealth of talent that they have. And um, uh, like I said, it's a tribute to Coach Vitello to be able to bring in those type of people that want to, you know, be a part of uh, something great. Yeah. Yeah. So you had mentioned that you – Got drafted as a two-way, obviously, and was DH and are playing first and, and pitching every fifth day. And I saw your first your first start in pro ball. You started, you hit fourth in the lineup, and you homered in your first step bat. Um, as cool as that is to play every day, that had to be super taxing on the body. Uh, I was just used to it. I mean, I, I just came to the park every day to play. I mean, I know obviously pro ball is different. The part that gets you in pro ball – especially at those levels. I mean, you're busing everywhere. So, right. you know, you're, you're, you're doing it, you know, every day it's your job. And now all of a sudden uh, it becomes, there's no days, you know, there's very few days off. So, I mean, that, that part you just had to, you had to get used to. Um, but um, it, um, um, you know, I started out in the New York pin league and I mean, those trips weren't, that that bad it's just you know the late nights and traveling on a bus and sleeping when you can type deal double a was that that became tough we were at that time we played in shreveport in the texas league and you go from you know all the way from shreveport to el paso to amarillo midland all those um but it was on a bus you know we had no no flights where i think nowadays at least double a you know those further trips would at least put you on a flight uh, so you could get there and get some rest. So a little bit things have changed, but uh, yeah, that, that was, you know, each, each step, I mean, it's uh, you, you've got to, you know, figure, figure things out, take care of your body, uh, get your rest as best you can. And uh, it's tough sleeping on those buses though, those uh, 10, 12 hour bus rides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pops out. So were you upset when they took the bat out of your hand? I, you know, not real. I mean, it's just you know at, at that time it's not really your choice, you know. So they they're making the they're making the choices and and uh, obviously uh, it worked out for me. So yeah. obviously they knew they knew better than I did what what the quickest route was there. Obviously I got uh, extremely you know huge break later in that that uh, seventy seven season um, getting traded. Uh, in August to an expansion team. So I uh, got really, that was, you know, the break that um, you're looking for to get that opportunity to go to, uh, uh, you know, an organization that doesn't have as much talent uh, in their system yet. And uh, was able to, uh, you know, go from double A uh, right to the big leagues. And, um, 
you know, got that opportunity and, you know, never, never went back to the minor leagues. Yeah. I, I, I didn't actually realize that, that it was through an expansion team. I didn't notice that. I did want to talk about that trade though, because I'm getting this on Wikipedia. So who knows how accurate this is, but it, <laughs> the way it reads it, it, were you a player to be named later in the trade? Correct. Uh-huh. So you've so got to have I, an argument for the best player to be named later ever. Because there, there's stats out there that. that's like they're bad for guys with that label. <laughs> well, you know, the, you know, who we didn't even know, you know, you don't even know what's going on. I mean, it's a, a relief pitcher named Dave Pagan uh, mm-hmm. was in the Seattle organization. And I think he was traded to Pittsburgh sometime in June. I think it was some, I don't, I don't even know the exact date that his part of the trade happened. And so, you know, as far as a minor league player, you have no idea that they're even looking at you. Right. Um, from my understanding later on, I got to meet the scout that was instrumental in picking, choosing me over Rod Scurry and um, another left-hander that uh, they, were, they were watching through the system. So I guess uh, kind of like – any of these deals that you kind of hear about and they go, well, we're going to look at, um, you know, these certain guys that are in this, you know, level or whatever. And, uh, um, so had no idea that that was people were even, you know, I, you know, you, you know, the scouts are out there, but you don't know you're, you're being looked at as potential to be the back end of a player to be named later deal. But, uh, I actually remember uh, he told me, he said, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, saw you pitch a four hit shutout. And I turned in, this is the guy that um, um, I'm turning in to be the, be the guy that we get. And uh, it was literally less than three or four days after that, that uh, I found out I was going to Seattle. That's that's nuts. So how long after the trade were you sent to the team? Like the initial trade? Yeah. We've, well, like I said, I pitched in Tulsa. We were then bused to um, sometime. I don't know if there was another game in Tulsa or whatever, but literally it was a, just two or three days after I pitched. Um and uh, we're in Jackson, Mississippi, and I'm having breakfast with the guys at the cafe, you know, in the hotel where we're staying at. And uh, uh, Timmy Murtaugh was their manager. Uh, this is Danny Murtaugh's son. And uh, Tim Murtaugh, he comes over and kind of just saying good morning to everybody like that. And then all of a sudden he goes, hey, Rick, he says, I need to see you for a minute. So I get up from the table and like uh, he's, this guy's hardly ever talked to me much less <laughs> get coming down at breakfast when we're eating and he comes over and he goes hey uh, uh i need to tell you something and i go yeah and he goes uh, you've been traded and i'm like geez here it is you know august this is like august the 19th and you've been traded and i'm like yeah i mean we only got a few weeks left in the season and he's got yeah he said uh seattle mariners uh you're going to seattle seattle and I'm thinking I'm going to, and I'm thinking in my mind, I mean, Seattle doesn't even have a triple A team, you know, where am I going to go? You know? Yeah. And he goes, uh, he goes, no, he says, you're, uh, I said, what, what, what minor league team am I going to like that? And he goes, no, he says, you're going to, he's going to big leagues. You're going to big leagues tomorrow. And I'm like, I thought he was joking with me or something. He goes, I said, uh, he goes, you're supposed to be in my room. In 10 minutes, the general manager is going to call my room and he wants to talk with you and fill you in on everything. And gosh, it was like your <laughs> mind is just swimming like crazy. It's like, oh my gosh, you know. And literally, I talked to Lou Gorman, who was the general manager at that time, and he goes, uh, uh, Congratulations, we're excited to have you. Da, da, da. And he says, uh, We need you in Seattle tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dang. I don't so even have, don't even have a suit. You know, I don't even have a suit. I'm not even sure I had a, even a suitcase. <laughs> I think all I had was, you know, a locker bag, you know, that you're carried around with you. Um, so, uh, that, sure enough, next day I'm on a plane, get there, like just 
literally maybe an hour or two before the game. And that night I'm pitching two innings out, in, out of the bullpen. <laughs> That's crazy. That is that's the best trade call ever. That's not yeah. at all how mine went. <laughs> I wish it was. That's that's that is nuts. So yeah, you so you're you're probably making plans to go home for the off season from double A and then you finish the year in the big leagues. That's not bad. Not a bad gig. Yeah, I'm I'm pulling every string trying to get to you know, get hooked up to a winter ball league or something, you know, to <laughs> try to make some money in the winter and uh Next thing you know, pitching in the big leagues. So, did you come out of the pen for your first couple of years? No, I made that night. I pitched two innings against Toronto, and then uh, we left in a day or two and went on the road back to the East Coast. The first city we went to was Cleveland, and um, one of the first couple of nights in Cleveland, I pitched again out of the bullpen. And uh, the next city we're going to is New York. We're going to play the play the Yankees. And uh, I grew up a huge Yankee fan. Mickey Mantle was like, you know, the man. And I want to be the next, you know, I mean, <laughs> Mickey Mantle, but I knew all the Yankees love, you know, just thought that was, was the greatest was the Yankees back in my day. And um, so uh, I went with uh, my roommate. I asked him, I said, is Craig Reynolds was my roommate. He was a shortstop. And I said, I said, any chance we can go out early? So I'd like to just, you know, see the monuments and walk around the stadium. He goes, yeah. He says, we'll take the subway out about, you know, two o'clock or whatever. So went with him and walked around and then finally got to the locker room and get to the locker room and sitting on my stool was a pitching chart. And I'm, you know, you know, if you show up, you know, they that means you're one of the starters in the next couple of days. Cause back then we had to chart, you know, the, the nights before leading up to your start. And, um, uh, so I'm like, I picked this chart up. I'm looking around, nobody's jumping out behind a wall or something and laughing, trying to get me to, um, you know, freak out or whatever. And I found, finally find the pitching coach and I have the chart and I find, find the pitching coach. And I said, Hey, I don't know if somebody put this in the wrong locker or what? And I, I said, but uh, just thought you, you might need this, you know? And he goes, no, you're pitching Thursday. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was, I still thought he was kidding with me, but anyway, that was my, my first, I got my first big league start in Yankee stadium. That's, sweet. That's awesome. So how, you know, you talk about wanting to see the monuments and stuff. How long did, did it take for you to kind of like mentally go from being a fan of baseball at the highest level to being like, Oh, I'm a part of this. Like this is, this is the league I'm playing in now. Well, I think I was still on that, you know, sugar high of just right. uh, being in the big leagues. I mean, you know, you're just enjoying it. I, you know, get my feet wet and I'm just thinking the rest of the season, I'll just be that, you know, pitching out like you were talking about pitching out of the bullpen, just kind of, kind of getting a little bit, you know, acclimated to, uh, to the big leagues. And like I said, though, the fortunate thing for me was being getting sent to an organization that had lacked a lot of talent. And, uh, obviously they'd had some injuries and didn't have the organization to call people up. Uh, so, you know, I got, I, I made, um, you know, I started the rest of the time I was up there that, that, that summer. So, um, I got that night and just, uh, you know, just, you know, took the ball from there, you know, didn't, uh, didn't do great. Didn't do bad, but I got to tell you real quick. I mean, that first night I'm warming up and catfish hunter during that, my day catfish hunter, like was one of the men. I mean, he just, had pitched with the Oakland A's. <clears throat> he was like one of the first big free agent signs and the Yankees signed him to a five-year deal. And our pitching coach had been his pitching coach in Oakland. And so when I'm warming up that night, he's over there talking to the pitching coach, Wes Stock. And I'm like, man, that's Catfish Hunter. Okay, I wonder if he'd sign my baby, you know, sign a baseball. <laughs> you know? But, uh, he 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 put played it cool. He didn't you know 
didn't say anything, didn't do anything. You know, every once in a while I kind of glance over there, but he's like, I'm sure saying, hey, kid, you better concentrate on what you're doing because the Yankees have won the World Series the year before in 1976. So it wasn't, uh, you're not going against, uh, yeah. you know, your average average team up there. And But uh, anyway, finally finished warming up, go out and um, take the mound and do my warm-up pitches and, Mickey Rivers is walking up to the plate and the first pitch I go into my wind up. And as soon as I lift, I'm left-handed. So obviously when I lifted my right leg, my left knee just started shaking so bad. I mean, it's quivering. And I somehow just went ahead and threw the ball while I threw it and it almost drills Mickey, you know, the first pitch. I mean, he goes down hard. And um, so I'm thinking to myself, oh, I just act like I kind of meant to do that, you know, and get the ball back. They don't know my knee's shaking that bad, I don't think, but get the ball back, take, take a deep breath. Oh, try to relax a little bit, get the sign, fastball away, boom, shake my head, going to wind up again. This time it's quivering just as bad. Throw the pitch, and this time it is right at his head, right at his head. I actually scream, "Watch out!" I mean, I thought I drilled him right, right in the head, and he goes down even harder. Look, kind of glance over their dugout; they're all on the top step, screaming bloody murder, call me everything in the book. Um, and now, in my mind, I'm going, "Oh my gosh, I've never experienced this. Had this experience in my life. I don't know what's going to happen here." And uh, get the ball back, try to relax. This time it's not the sh not shaking as bad. Throw the ball. Mickey jumps out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm um, at him again. He just jumps back. And the, thank goodness the umpire called it a strike. But um, anyway, Mickey then gets an infield hit. The next pitch, Willie Randolph is the second hitter, takes the first pitch to right field. I got first and second, nobody out. Thurman Munson coming up, and I'm going through my mind. I'm like, this, this is going to be the shortest outing anybody's ever had in the major leagues. I'm not going to get anybody out. What's, you know, holy, I'm just going, oh, my gosh. And somehow the count got to 2-2. Two -two. My catcher puts down a breaking ball. I snap one off. I get struck a swing and miss from Thurman Munson. And I'm thinking, I'm so relieved. I at least got an out, you know, get a, get uh, Thurman Munson out really kind of gave me a lift. Yeah. Uh, get, Reggie, get Reggie Jackson's next, get him out. Chandler. So gets a base hit up the middle they score a run and I got Nettles out and somehow survived that first inning. And, uh, but, uh, I'll never forget that experience that night. That was just unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, that'd have been something to clear the benches on your first ever thrown pitch in in the league. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that'd the, been, first that'd been... pitch, the first first two pitches that you throw. <laughs> <laughs> that'd have been something. Uh, were you ever involved <laughs> in any bad ones? Like any ones that really blew up? Yeah, I hit a guy. Um, I predicted uh, they. Uh, they had a pitcher named uh, uh, Bruce Keeson. was kind of known as a headhunter. And um, I think he was pitching for the Angels at that time. And so they'd hit our best hitter was Buddy Bell. And so didn't, the manager didn't say anything. Catcher didn't say anything. I just, you know, I'd always been told your job as a starting pitcher is to protect your own, you know. And um, he had knocked down a couple guys, but he finally he ended up hitting Buddy. And so their their best hitter on their tank on the Angels at that time was Rod Carew. And um, uh, so Rod Carew's, Rod Carew coming up, future Hall of Famer, and I just drill him right right in the ribs, you know. <laughs> and uh, they didn't they didn't throw me out. And back then, you know, you were allowed kind of like the one payback, I guess, uh, type deal. But uh, they were screaming and yelling, you know. But um, I guess the worst one was against Oakland. Um, hit, a, hit a guy in Oakland, kind of the same, same situation when I was starting. And uh, that one, that one uh, he charged the mound on that one. And uh, thank goodness the first baseman they were <laughs> – 
I think they knew this guy was getting it. And he 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 intercepted him before he got to me. So, but both both benches cleared. Uh, probably the best one I'd ever been in though was uh, I was pitching for Texas in uh, in Texas, and we're playing the A's again. And Billy Ma- Billy Martin was the manager, and we had a right-handed pitcher, uh, Danny Darwin, and they had a DH named Cliff Johnson. And I don't know what had happened somewhere before in the past, but anyway, he drilled Cliff with two outs, nobody on, just like I'm drilling you just for the heck of it. And so Cliff takes the hit, goes down to first, but now he's on first, there's two outs. The next guy hits a lazy fly ball to center field. Well, Cliff starts running to second, gets about halfway, decides he's going to make a left-hand turn and charge the mound. So he then proceeds. Next thing you know, him and Danny are, you know, on the mound going at it. Everybody's coming out. And uh, this one, it, it lasted, you know, longer than most of them. The umpires couldn't do anything. Martin was in the middle of it. And finally, uh, I mean, a big pile in, on the, the mound there, grass area. And finally, Martin comes up out of the middle of the pile. His jersey's all torn off of him. He's got blood coming out of his ear. And he's screaming, all right, guys, that's enough. That's enough. He says, that's a good one. Okay, let's play some baseball. <laughs> <laughs> that's good stuff. Yeah, that's uh, that's got to be pretty, pretty scary, though, when you got – you know, a lot of a lot of big dudes that that pissed off coming out. You know, ready to rumble. Hey, uh, something going on because I mean, guys are going to get hit. Right. You know, guys. In my mind, the guys are a little bit more protected. I mean, it doesn't happen quite as much anymore. I mean, heck, the hitters even if you just go inside on them, they're you know getting all bent out of shape just because you throw a ball inside on them. <laughs> and um, I remember. Uh, when I was pitching coach there in LA, we had Zach Grinky. Well, the A's, I mean, the, uh, this was the angels and they always tried to pitch Justin Turner inside cause that leg kick, they all tried to pitch him inside, but you know, they consistently couldn't throw, they couldn't throw it in there and throw it where they want to. And he'd end up getting hit. And so he'd gotten hit. I don't know how many times. And so, our pitcher was Zach Grinky that night and Grinky drills their catcher Montero and hits him. And of course, then they kind of, there's a little ruckus on that. Well, of course in the national league, the pitcher's got to come up at that time. So when now, when Grinky comes to bat, I forget who was pitching for them, but their pitcher drills Grinky in, I mean, up by his head, up in his, you know, hit him like right in here. And of course we're out, everybody's out of the dugout. Of course, as a coach, you're not supposed to do anything. The thing was that I was so ticked off about was that their guys had kept hitting our guys. So I'm trying to find their pitching coach. Next thing you know, they're (laughs) they're splitting splitting us up, me and the pitching coach and the, you know, McGuire's got, uh, uh, Mark McGuire was our hitting instructor at the time, hitting coach for the, and he had somebody pinned. I mean, it was, uh, we all got fined because uh, coaches are supposed to separate things instead of getting into it. But, but just part of it. So, how, I mean, we'll get to your coach in a minute, but how much say do you have as a pitching coach? Are you, are you having to tell like Grinky there that you want the guy hit or is he taking that into his own hands? Well, uh, it's, it's not, it's not always my call, even though we have in our talks a bit against certain teams, you know, it's going to come up, Hey, we got to protect our guys. And, um, so we would do that usually as a group of when our pitchers meetings would be, you know? So and a lot of times, usually though, it's not personally always me. It's probably the manager stepping in because he's like had enough of it and don't want to see it anymore. And um, so it was just that situation. But the actual, I mean, if it's actually going to happen, it's going to come from, now there are guys who are going to do it on their own. Don't get me wrong. Um, yeah. uh, that are going to probably, you know, 
do something on their own, but most of the time the manager is going to actually make that, make that call. I want, I want this guy down. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm sure you're tired of talking about this, but I was, I was audibly laughing in the living room just now when I was reading about it. Um, I got to hear, I got to hear about the thumbtack. <laughs> got to hear about it. All right. Um, so this season is 1980 in, in Seattle. And I actually had got off to an unbelievable start. I actually made, made the all-star team. Uh, I was a representative for Seattle and I actually was throwing extremely well the first part of the season. And, um, but, uh, all the games that I was winning early in the season, you know, the close ones, three to two, four to three, whatever it may be. Now, all of a sudden, right after the, after the all-star break, I went through this stretch where we're, we're losing, you know, we're losing all those close games. And so I'm on this run of probably losing, I don't know, six or seven games in a row. And, uh, just, uh, real frustrated with, uh, how things are, you know, had reversed. And, um, so they'd always told me that they wanted me to be like Tommy John, that, uh, the thing is though, whenever Tommy John pitched, there was always a scuff on the baseball. So he had this super sinker, you know, and slider. And that's kind of what I was at that time, kind of a sinker slider guy. And so before I went out this game and I had two starts left. It was like, I think a little over a week left in the season in 80 and I'm going out to warm up and I pass this bulletin board and I go, you know, I'm going to stick this thumbtack in my glove and, and whack up the ball and see what happens. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't get it through my glove and I ended up taping it to this finger and uh, so, anyway, it, it didn't do anything. It didn't it didn't work. I just got caught using it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just constantly taped to your finger while you're pitching. Yeah, so it's on my glove hand, you know. So for me, okay. you know, take the ball, you know. So first couple of innings, I don't try it. Now all of a sudden, the third inning comes, and I said, "Well, I might as well." The bad thing was, I got to tell you, the funniest part is I I have it on during, you know, when I warm up and I don't even, I don't even think I tried to whack it anytime when I was even warming up. I didn't, even, I didn't really know what I was doing with it. And um, so now it's in Kansas City, it's still warm. Come in after warming up and I'm sitting in the dugout, got my glove off and grab a towel, I'm sweating, take my hat off. And I go to wipe the my forehead off and this thing scratches me right across my forehead, right through here. <laughs> right then I should have took the thing off. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was an omen. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely uh, watch out. You, you know, you don't know what you're doing. And um, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, yeah. So now the third inning, and the first batter was Willie Wilson, I think. It might have been the third, yeah, third inning or so. And he gets a base hit, and then Frank White hits a gapper. And um, so somehow Wilson, I guess when he's on base, he sees me, you know, take my glove off, do this. And I guess the, ref the light hit maybe the silver or something. He, he saw, like, he saw something different scores when he scores he asked the umpire at home plate he goes i didn't think pitchers could have anything on their hands and umpire goes, well they're not supposed to so anyway i see him coming out i turn around the center field and i'm trying to get this thing off and i can't get it off and so i put my glove back on and he's out there he said well, let me check your hands so of course i show him my left hand like this and he goes well you we see both hands and so now i take my glove off and i hold my hand down like this <laughs> and he grabs my hand <laughs> <laughs> the thing sticks in me you're out of here <laughs> <laughs> that, that guy probably goes into police training and talk to guys like 
<laughs> hey, make sure make sure they don't have anything sharp in there before you stick stick your hand in their pocket. Heck, now you are now you're coming out and checking your hands now when you come out of the game, right? Yeah, they check your belt, Every hat, day. everything, yeah, jersey. <laughs> they would always – last year when they started doing that, it seemed like they always did it after an inning I'd given up a run. J- just to make me even more mad as I'm coming off the field. Yeah, let, make me – tick me off even more. And I'm, <laughs> I'm telling the umpire, I'm going, he said, you're out here. And I said – I said, and his name was Bill Kunkel. And I said, Bill, I said, it didn't work. It's not, they just got two hits. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's that's nuts. The thumbtack. <laughs> I, I think it's a good idea, though. I mean, hey, it could have worked. I saw I saw an interview with Smoltz one time where he had, I think it was Smoltz, he had taken apart half the baseball by the time the interview was over. Like he had about three inches of the seams out. I was like, this guy, I'm way behind. I, I don't do any of this stuff. <laughs> I gotta I gotta pick it up. <laughs> hey, you just gotta get better. You gotta get smart. You gotta get smarter. I do. I do. Um, so I listed some of your, some of your accolades here. Um, you were the oldest pitcher in the league in 96 and 97 and you led the league in ERA. That's pretty, I mean, you had to show the youngins how to do it, huh? I, you know, I had two parts of my career, man. I was a starter for the first 10 years of my career. And then I had, uh, shoulder surgery in LA. And one of the things, even though I still could pitch, but I still had, uh, Dr. Job told me, he says, you got, he said, he says, you're going to be fine. But he says, the only thing we know about this surgery is that your endurance, uh, it's weakens your endurance. And I'm like, what does that mean? And he goes, well, you're going to find, you know, kind of find out. And exactly was that, I mean, I just, I'd be fine and go, didn't matter the exact number of pitches, but obviously the colder weather or whatever. But <clears throat> so uh, that year in 87, I got traded to Oakland and pretty much my, you know, uh, they put me, you know, tried me in the bullpen and things, my stuff started getting a little bit better, but it was because I was using being used in short, short period of time. And then uh, by the middle of that year in 1988, then I went to being what, you know, the setup kind of guy. So I was pitching the seventh and eighth inning. Eckersley was the closer, but I was uh, pitching the seventh and eighth inning, depending on where the where they were in the lineup. And, uh, you know, it just kind of gave me a, a new uh, lease on life as far as pitching because I was, I could, and I could pitch, I could pitch several days in a row. That didn't bother me. Just, was the 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 length or then you know the endurance part uh, my shoulder uh, that joint just uh, would wouldn't lock up but it was just like as an arthritic situation and uh, so anyway it's a blessing in disguise I guess because then I, I pitched yeah. you know ten more years out of, the bull, out of the bullpen and still was pitching good till actually I had Tommy John when I was forty three <laughs> yeah then with that going to that role, did that take some adjusting or was it something you realized off the rip? Like, Hey, my stuff plays pretty good out of this role. Well, I mean, first part, it takes adjustment just because of the, you know, the, the warm up. how quick sometimes you got to warm up because every, every situation is a little bit different. Sometimes it's got to go, you know, pretty fast. And other times you're starting an inning, but you never know what that situation is going to be. The good thing was in Oakland with the Marusa and Duncan, you pretty much they narrowed it down to where they knew you knew what kind of part of the the lineup that part of the lineup that was going to be your section and so watching the game and going on so I mean you know before that inning you kind of were moving around and doing the things I mean you see guys you know down there now but we even did the same thing but maybe not as much with the bands and throwing you know um uh, throwing those weighted balls against the wall or whatever guys are doing now as much, but uh, you kind of knew the area and the time that they were going to use you. And you knew speci- pretty much specifically this part of the lineup is going to be yours if you were called upon. So you got your mind right. And, and uh, you know, if sometimes it, things got hadn't moved a little bit quicker than it should, obviously, 
the delays were a little bit easier to send the catcher out and the manager, you know, I mean, there was, we, we were able to stall a little bit more than what they've allowed to put in into the situation now where there, everything's kind of 30 second time for, for mound visit and things like that. But, uh, um, those were the, those were the things, the adjustment part too. And, you know, we didn't have the, the amount of information that's out there now, but I mean, it, you just, you just kind of learned your role and, and uh, adapted to it. And, uh, you know, for me, it was a huge adrenaline rush to be able to come into the game when it was close and face, you know, whoever that other team's best and best left-handed hitter. I mean, I took that as a personal challenge. You know, that's my guy. I got to get, I got to get that guy out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the first things that pop up when you look up your name is, is your numbers in the postseason. Um, you're kind of known as a, as a very successful postseason pitcher. Uh, what was it about that setting that, you think you thrived in? Uh, you know, each, I mean, early on, I mean, when I, when I was with LA, I didn't get to start. I pitched out of the bullpen, but I wasn't, a, I wasn't a relief pitcher pretty much at that time. So um was as good, but I think later on, I think you get a, you get comfortable in your role. You get comfortable in that environment. And, uh, and the best thing, you know, we had those great teams in Oakland and we were going to the playoffs a lot. You just – one thing that, you know, I thought Duncan and La Russa were great at was just the preparation for the team. And, um, you know, I remember Tony always saying, he says, hey, this isn't – nothing's different right now. It's just the postseason. There's going to be a lot of different – the lights and the and questions and all that. But he says, you know, we've been, we've been preparing – all season for this time. So I just took that to heart. It's like, you know, just slow, you know, slow the process down. Uh, don't let, don't let your adrenaline get, you know, overwhelm you. Don't get moving too fast. I mean, just take, stay within yourself and, you know, trust, trust your stuff. I mean, you, all of a sudden, you, you know, the adrenaline, you can't stop adrenaline, but you know, it, w it was the ability for me just to slow it down and not try to get outside of myself and just stay within myself and 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 uh, execute pitches. Yeah. Was is there any certain game or outing or at bat that really sticks out to you during the postseason? Uh, Not, not, you know, not one, not one particular, obviously the, uh, you know, winning and uh, winning, obviously uh, in 88, I threw the ball well, but we didn't, we didn't win. I mean, I actually got the only win in that series and, and uh, I think it was game, game three or four at home uh, when it went to extra innings, I pitched a couple of innings in that one. And, uh, but um I don't think there's, you know, nothing, one particular, I can't, I can't think of that offhand. I didn't, yeah. I didn't look at it that way. It's just like, you know, they pay to come out and get your, get your guy. I think more, you know, uh, each, each one was, was uh, uh, just a special moment. Just live in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And so obviously you had a great career through 20 years in, in the league. And, and like you said, a surgery ended that. Um, and then it was, it was a pretty quick transition into coaching for you. Um, and just, and just talking to you for this little bit, like it, it clear, it's clear that you really love the sport and, and love being around the sport. So I assume that was a pretty easy decision for you. Well, uh, obviously I was 43 at the time that I retired. So my kids were grown. I'd already, my daughter had already graduated high school and my son was 16 the year that I retired. And so my wife <clears throat> wanted me to promise her that I would not, that I would stay home till he graduated. So I coached his summer team, 16, 17, 18. And when he graduated, because Larusa, Larusa and Duncan wanted me to, actually the very, the very next year, he wanted me to stay in as a bullpen coach the very next year. Uh, that I retired. Uh, he's like, he said, he called me that winter and says, I want you to be our bullpen coach. And I told him, I said, I can't right now. I promised I'd stay home. So 
Uh, but it's crazy because I'd had a couple other calls and I told them the same thing. And uh, that year that my son graduated high school and went to college, I uh, got a couple of calls that winter. And um, the one that stuck mostly was um, Dave Wallace and Tommy Lasorda called me one night and said, um, we're getting, trying to get as many guys that have played their system back in our to uh, come back and be coaches. And um, so um, I didn't really know what role or what exactly, but I came to spring training and after you put the uniform back on and get back on the field, it made it pretty easy, but they made it also easy for me. They didn't, I didn't have to go and be with one team. I was kind of a, a rover uh, first. So I just, I went through the system and evaluated our guys and did some teaching and, and coaching, obviously. And uh, then I became the uh, pitching coordinator and I was that for two and a half years. And then I became, uh, then I got the offer to be the uh, uh, pitching coach for the Dodgers in 2006. Yeah. Uh, I've always had this question. So as, as a big league pitching coach and obviously a guy, that has your history, it's, it's a little bit easier to relate to, but you're, you're talking to some of the best pitchers in the, in the world. Um, how, how do you get them to, I guess, kind of take in what you're suggesting? Uh, and you feel comfortable enough to kind of to tinker with guys who have clearly done well enough to get to the, the high stage. Well, um, you know, each guy's different. I mean, you got to handle each each person individually. You got to get to know them. You've got to show them that you care about them. You got to you got to earn their trust. Basically, um, I never tried to force anybody to do anything. It's always a suggestion. I have a suggestion. You know, try it or not. You know, pretty much. But one thing is, each guy uh, you had to know a little bit about them and you also had to be prepared. Um, so if I make a suggestion, I got to have a reason for it. It's not just because, Hey, I think this will work. I mean, I had a, I would have a, a format down to why I think it, you know, and show them, you know, you guys are all, I mean, even now you guys are about all the, you know, track man, Kenneth, you know, Kenneth tracks, you have all this information that's telling you spin rate. Well, Early on, you know, even in 2006, we didn't have we didn't have all that stuff. Yeah, um, yeah, it was slowly coming in. So, ours, my my visual over my time. I mean, to watch a Nolan Ryan, watch a Steve Carlton, watch a Dwight Gooden, watch Brett Saberhagen, Tom Seaver. I mean, these guys are all Hall of Famers. Martinez, uh, Mariano Rivera. I mean, you look at them and you're watching and what happens is if you really break them down, you're seeing certain parts of their body, they all do certain things well and they do it consistently. There's separation in their timing and there's a flow to their, to what makes them happen. And you have, and they might go at different, you know, different speeds of their, their rhythm, but they, they all have, certain things that make them, you know, who they are. And then whenever you, you start looking at, and the, my thing that probably helped me the most was being around Sandy Koufax. Koufax was, you know, obviously a Dodger and he coached, he was around when I was uh, a player with the Dodgers and still around then when I came back in. Well, his main guy that he was around was a guy named Dave Wallace and Dave, uh, was actually the guy that came in and wanted me to, uh, like I said, he was one of the guys that called. And they simplified the ba the basic things, what you want to really look for and how, how to make things, how to be strong with your body and work down the mound. And um, so to me, it was always about trying to explain the basics. Where are we, where are we trying to get our power from? And them understanding the ground, the ground surface, how they how they going to go from one, you know, from their position to to landing and be in control, but also 
produce as much power as possible. Everybody throws well, but it's like, what then can, how can we make you better to throw more strikes, to execute pitches better? Those are the things that guys have to understand. And then, uh, you know, even, even Kerr struggled when he was coming, you know, his young guy and what he always wanted to do. If he got in trouble, he wanted to go harder, right? He wanted to go, you know, from, you know, 95 to 97. Well, he could throw 97. The problem was he couldn't control 97. He pitched well at 94 to 95 and threw the ball where he wanted to. And the other part was, you know, we, you know, sitting down with him and showing him, this is your spray. This is your consistent pattern. You like to throw glove side, but you're also your breaking ball. You're doing nothing to arm side to get the hitters off. They're all going to zero in on this side of the plate. We've got to do more over here. And how are we going to do it? And moving it. He was a guy when he started out, he threw from the third base side of the rubber. And I'm like, what if we just go to the middle part of the rubber? And then how about if we, instead of just being mainly fastball curveball, can we come up with some, an off speed pitch that's in between that you can get over more consistent. And when he started getting the slider, from 2009, you look at Kershaw's numbers from, you know, the all-star break of 2009 through his career, it's unbelievable. And just adding that, you know, that third pitch that he could command consistently and, uh, you know, you made the, he's going to be a future Hall, you know, he'll be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Yeah. And I was actually going to ask, you know, when you got, when you have a guy like him coming up and, He's young and he's there. Do you know pretty early like he's going to be special, just the way he approached the game and um, all of, all the stories you hear about Kershaw and his preparation and, and all that? Did you see that pretty early on? Well, Kersh, of course, was a high school sonny, and um, so <clears throat> young guy taken you know in the draft in two thousand seven, I think it was, and uh, six or seven, and so. I remember the first time they sent him over and let him pitch an inning in a spring training game. We were playing the Red Sox. It was a night game. And the middle part of their lineup was they had a, they had a triple-A hitter batting, but behind him was uh, David Ortiz, Big Poppy, Sean Casey. And I'm trying to think of who the next guy. But anyway, he comes in and he gives up a home run to the first batter. And uh, no big deal. There's a guy that, you know, I don't think he ever made it to the big leagues, but strikes out David Ortiz, strikes out Sean Casey, and strikes out the next guy. And so in comes over. Here's an 18-year-old guy coming over, sits down, and he's just got this big grin on his face. And, you know, most guys would be going, man, why did I make that pitch, you know, give up a home run? He didn't care. All he said was, that was fun. That was super fun. He said, that was, you know, and I could just see from right then that he had what it made because the game itself, it was like, and I know you're young and everything, you're energetic, but I mean, he didn't even worry about the home run. He just enjoyed the moment of being out there and getting to compete against the best. Yeah. And that next year they got called up. The very next year he gets called up and the same, you could see the same thing. Obviously then when things went a little bit, maybe not as good as he wanted to, that's where you started seeing that he had to go through the experience of some failure. And I always believe you're going to, when you fail, that's the time that you're open to some suggestions and maybe we can make make some, can you make an adjustment here off of that? And he was able to make those adjustments. He, he took stuff and he put it, put it to work. I mean, yeah, he worked hard and did all the other things, but I mean, he evaluated himself unbelievable. And that's, I think is the difference is because he, uh, he evaluated himself. Honestly, he didn't make excuses. It's like, I got I need to get better. I need to do this. I, I've got to be able to, land this pitch when 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 I need to and uh this guy is like I mean he's out there he's like a freight train coming at you he just 
continues to pound strikes at you. Yeah. Come at you and beat you. For sure. Um, and, and you kind of mentioned him already talking about Grinky, but is he one of the most interesting guys you've ever coached? For sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He seems like a character. Yeah. You talk about, you know, you talk about as being a coach and each guy, you know, you're expecting, but you know, Zach, Zach was unique, very unique. He I mean he knew what he wanted to do, but uh, he was another. You know, if you you look at the time he was there, I mean, Kirsch made him better. Kirsch makes everybody better because of his ethics, his work ethic, and the way he goes about his business. He just makes you better. Uh, you know, and Zach being around him, it's like you know I'm supposed to be one of the dudes too. You know, but you work you work a lot harder than I do. If I want to be one of the dudes, we had Hunjin Ryu and Hunjin saw the same thing. I remember talking to Hunjin through his interpreter one time. Hunjin after about three months, you know, in the big leagues with us, he goes, I want to, if I want to hang with these guys, I'm going to have, I'm going to have to up my routine. And so you want that internal competition. It's not that they're competing against yourself. They're competing because they want to be, they want to be associated with the best, right? You want to be the best. Well, you got to you got to do what the best do, and it's not just the physical training, but the mental You know, the mental side of it. Preparation for you guys. Part of it now. I mean, you got to get physically ready again. But you know, up here, preparing what you're going to do before you go out there, and knowing what what how to. You got to know what how you're going to attack those other guys. Obviously, you got great stuff. But how am I going to the second and time, third time through the lineup? And Zach uh, was, um, you know, over time. I mean, he wanted he wanted less information, but but he wanted more specific information. And what I provide for him was, you know, this guy key strikeout situation. If you get the two strikes, you know maybe a back, a back door slider on this guy's when, you know, is vulnerable. He might not want to show it to you. You really got to do it, but he loved that kind of stuff. He wanted something kind of unique like that, that, that he could pull out of the hat and, uh, because he could execute pitches, man. He could. And, um, he was pretty cool when he, I called him when he signed that big contract with, with the, uh, with the diamondbacks. And he goes, he goes, man, he says, Thanks for all your help. He says, you made, you made me better. He says, I got to tell you, he said, I, pro- I probably owe you a, a little bit of, I probably owe you part of this contract. And I said, yeah, one, one or two percent. <laughs> <laughs> Never got it. But. Yeah. Yeah. They sound some big boys these days. Um, Chanel, you got anything? Um, let's see. Okay. So you've named a lot of, I mean, obviously you've played with a lot of good good players and then you've also coached a bunch of good players if you had to go with one guy game seven of the world series who who are you putting out on the bump no i'd put kirsch up there anytime yeah Yeah. i figured you'd say that that'd be yeah i mean kirsch has gotten you know kirsch has gotten you know the in my opinion the bad bad rap over but early you know when he was when he was young younger He's still not super old by any means, but I mean, you saw what he did yesterday. I mean, this guy still is going to come at you with it, whatever, even though he's got his abilities are even, you know, have decreased some. But I mean, to go out and throw seven perfect on your first time out after not even knowing, you know, not having Tommy John surgery, taking the PRP injections and not even getting off the mound till, uh, start throwing off the mound till late late January. So um, I just hate that he had to go through all the stuff that he had to early in his career. Cause we asked so much of him to pitch out of the bullpen, you know, come back on three days rest. And he had to be, you know, he had to be the guy. I mean, he was the guy, but we, you know, we put him in, you know, probably some, you know, tough situations that he doesn't deserve, you know, that type of negative. Uh, criticism that they want to give him from from some of the playoff stuff, but uh, this guy is um, is a, you know I I I during his prime I'd take him I'd take him out there with anybody. 
Yeah. yeah. It's crazy how many arms the Dodgers just keep rolling out, though. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Bueller's turned into Cy Young guy and Dustin May coming back this year. Just, just a lot of guys and a lot of stuff. Yeah, you, you got a factory going out there. Well, I mean, they've been really good. This organization for over 50 years, and I, and I, I think it really goes back to the – to the uh, Red Adams and Sandy Koufax and guys like Dave Wallace, that foundation and not that they, all those are the teachings nowadays, but I mean, this organization for a long time has had a lot of pride in pitching and they produced over year after year after year. And now the talent levels still continue to be there. Um, and the scouts do, scouts do a great job, but I think, you know, I think the, you know, the coaching and the teaching and the philosophies there are extremely, extremely uh, off the charts and, and all those things come together. And what I really, though, during my time, though, guys like Kirsch and Zach that come in, but uh, Julio, you know, Urias, the Bueller, I mean, they see, they see a guy like Kirsch and he, he makes everybody that comes in there, uh, not only a, you know, they just make – they're good teammates and they, they work hard and they, they push each other to that limit to be the best, and that's what you got to have. Yeah, for sure. Well, Coach, we don't want to take up too much of your time, even though we probably could go all day. I uh, know you got stuff to do. But really appreciate you coming on. Um, obviously, you have an open invitation to come back and uh, hope you have a good rest of the year. No, I'm excited. Uh, I still work doing some stuff with them. I go mainly through the minor league systems and uh, watch your guys. I mean, uh, we got some, like I said, I'd be excited to get Dustin back during the season, but we got a couple guys in double A that probably be up there sometime. Uh, things need to, they need to come up. This thing good too. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, they just got to get some more, more innings in. So, uh, uh, I want you guys, though, you guys get healthy, get back out there. I know uh, you guys are itching to do what do what you can do, but you got to you got to get yourself healthy, stay healthy. You know, this is just part of this is a little setback. So, um, you know, do the process, make yourself strong and stay smart and get yourself back out there where you can start competing and do what you want to do. And that's that's go win some ball games. Yeah, I pre- yeah, appreciate it. That's, uh, that's good stuff. Um, thanks again for coming on and, and have a good rest of the day. All right, guys. I'll take care. Anytime. Yeah, you too. All right, see you.